Hi, thank you so much for joining me. My name is Jason Levine and welcome to part two of how to make great videos with color. So today we're going to feature working with input LUTs, flat footage, and really focusing on how to use HSL secondaries to target specific color ranges in your videos. So here we are inside of Premiere Pro with some footage that I shot quite a few years ago. And actually you can find this finished video on my YouTube channel, which is youtube.com slash Jason Levine video. And last week we were really focusing on using the basic corrections panel inside of Lumetri. Once again, we're in our color workspace. And if you look up at the top here on my screen, you'll see here we are inside of Lumetri where we have basic correction and creative. So we really focused on these two last week. We talked a bit about using curves. So these are kind of the traditional RGB curves as well as hue saturation curves. Um, and additionally, we talked about the native vignette. And then if you go under creative, this is where we added like sharpen, vibrance, and saturation. We talked a bit about faded film and using these creative LUTs. Now, along the way, I was talking about how some of the footage that I was using was either flat or some of it had some of the color baked in. And a lot of people are asking, well, yeah, I hope you're going to talk a bit more about shooting sort of flat or what a lot of the newer cameras today are doing, which is shooting in log. And you've probably heard that whether you're shooting Canon or Panasonic or Sony, uh, shooting in log, S log, C log, every manufacturer seems to have their own flavor and own brand of that. Uh, subsequently, they also have their own LUT their own specific lookup table, uh, which you would use either in camera for display or that something that you would apply in Premiere after the fact to basically uh, display those colors correctly on screen. So here what we have, this was shot with a Canon 7D and we're going back about seven or eight years with this footage. <laughs> no kidding. First of all, I have no gray hair nor a beard. I look so youthful. Um, now on the left, what you're seeing here is the original footage, the original shot as it was. Now this is me and my oft collaborator, Fuzzy Island. Uh, we were shooting um, a, a, a live music video for this TV show of mine, um, still unreleased, called Just Play Music. And it was just me doing all the production, including being on the show. So setting up microphones, setting up lights, setting up multiple cameras, cabling, everything else, clapboard, action, get on the scene, mic myself, and just start going. What did I forget to do? Well, I forgot to effectively flatten out uh, the image in my camera. So when I recorded to my sadly compressed file format here, <clears throat> which is H.264, this is what the original video looked like. Now, while it's not terrible, obviously, now this is just the color of the room. So the room colors themselves, not beautiful, right? Not super pleasant. Skin tones and things don't look too bad. But the problem is, and you can see it already, that I there's just not a lot of shadow detail here. So again, when we start to go into the shadows, into black, you can't even see the mic stand and sort of the shadow of myself on this couch here. It just goes into complete darkness. This shirt is actually navy blue. There's a bit of contrast between my shirt and the black microphone, but it's almost lost. And again, really in the corners, the bottom corners here, it just looks like it fades away into complete darkness. So this was as a result of just recording in camera with my picture profile, probably just standard. I didn't change it to neutral. And one of the things that I learned years ago, if many of you were part of the DSLR boom of the mid mid 2000s, 2010 and beyond, um, Mr. Philip Bloom, who really taught me how to shoot with a DSLR, amazing guy, uh, used to talk about going into your picture profiles and starting with something like neutral. And then effectively, because the Canons at the time didn't shoot into this, into log, uh, what you would do then is you would go into the picture profile and you would drop the contrast, you would drop the saturation, and you would drop the sharpness. And the idea there being that you are effectively giving yourself more latitude later on for being able to grade the content. When all of this is already kind of baked in like this, um, especially for a novice, it becomes very difficult to take this and try and tame those colors, especially if you really, if you don't know what you're doing. And as we talked about last week, if you're using uh, one of our looks or style LUTs, or if you're using a lot of the popular presets out there, like magic bullet looks and things, well, if you start with footage that's high contrast, high saturation, and very sharp, and you apply a preset to it, and the same can be said for using photos and Instagram, 
if it's too colorful, too saturated, too contrasty, one, the preset apply, it's too much. It doesn't look right. Sometimes it'll just go into complete darkness because it's too saturated, too much contrast. And if you start to back some of those things away, it'll often start to degrade the image. Now, again, a lot of this has to do with the fact that the Canon 7D at the time was recording to a fairly compressed H.264 uh, codex. So already you're in 8-bit. There's a lot of media, a lot of data that's being lost at the sensor. But you're not helping yourself by recording this way. So what do you do? Well, when we first introduced Lumetri Color, now some of this has changed, and I'm going to point out a couple of things which are hmm, questionable, but I'm going to show them to you because this can help, uh, especially if you're really just kind of getting into this, just trying to do this for fun, and start trying to get creative with color and had problems in the past. Now, obviously, you can use the basic correction panel to remove, con you know, to minimize contrast and readjust exposure, highlights, bring up the shadows, etc. But as mentioned, um, we do have this input LUT section here, okay? And the input LUT, again, where we talked about last week, input LUTs and display LUTs, your input LUT is basically used to interpret that footage and interpret that content in a particular way. And before, uh, probably about 18 months ago, maybe even two years ago, before we sort of updated some of the presets and the creative LUTs inside of Lumetri, you used to have to apply an input LUT to your content before you could begin applying the creative LUTs, okay? Now, you don't have to do that anymore. However, we used to have an entire array of input LUTs for lots of various cameras. Now, you're seeing this Canon 7D one right here. Now, this actually isn't going to be in your default list. Here's the, def the default list of input LUTs that you see. And actually, what you can see is, of course, these are all sort of log-based. We do have the one Phantom Rec 709 here. Um, We've got a, a lot of these log-based uh, input LUTs. Well, we actually still give you all of the various camera LUTs, which you can then apply. And you can even, in the case of like this DSLR footage, apply them after the fact. Now today, of course, I'll typically flatten everything out ahead of time. I'm still shooting with a, ca with a camera that doesn't do log, okay? People are talking a lot about log. It's really got to do with the tonal range of the sensor and maximizing your dynamic range. If you shoot in log, you're going to have the maximum amount of dynamic range. Assuming, of course, that you're also recording to something like ProRes 10 or 12-bit, uh, Cineform, GoPro Cineform, as we mentioned, DNX HD or DNX HR. If you're shooting in log and you know recording to H.264 or AVC HD, and some of them are very compressed, you're, you're kind of not really going to get all the benefits of shooting in log. And in fact, when you go to grade after the fact or reapply a specific input LUT, you might already degrade your signal. So in my case, I don't have the option to shoot in log. So I, in my camera using the picture profile, um, go into neutral and then start readjusting saturation, contrast, and sharpness, dropping all those down to give me an image that looks more like this. Now, because I hadn't done that, I needed, I needed a way to somehow flatten this out. I didn't know how to manually flatten something. And just adjusting contrast highlight didn't really do it for me. So I'm going to show you something very quickly here, which you'll be able to access yourself. Now, I am, of course, on a Mac. It'll be slightly different on the PC, how you access the actual um, uh, program itself. But you'll see here I am in Applications. And in Premiere Pro, this is the actual application of Premiere Pro. If I right click or control click here, now don't just go ahead and do this. I'm showing you where this is to show you, reveal to you where we have a whole bunch of classic uh, uh, legacy input LUTs which you can access, which you can try. I'm doing this more for experimental purposes. If we go under show package contents, all right, you're gonna see a contents folder. And in the contents folder, you're going to see a folder called Lumetri. And in the Lumetri folder, you see a folder called LUTs, okay? go into LUTs. And in LUTs, you've got creative, legacy, and technical. And if we go into legacy, here's where you're going to find all of the various LUTs that we used to install in either the input LUT section or the creative section. And in this case, you can see I've got all my Canon 5D and 7D. We've got some C300, C500. This was probably before the C100 even came out. Um, FS700, okay. F55. Various gamma, 1.8, 2.2. 2. 
Nikon D800, which is what I shoot with now. Again, you can see you've got the, uh, by the way, the SL stands for speed looks. These were looks that we licensed from a company called speed looks. Um, there's all your Rec. 709s, S-Log2, S-Log3. Again, if you're shooting Sony, very useful to have these. By the way, you can find all of these online elsewhere anyway. And then sort of a universal LUT. Um, this one is particularly good if, again, you're shooting, I used to use this often if I were shooting directly on the iPhone using just the iPhone's native camera, not even using something like Filmic Pro. And again, everything's very saturated, very contrasty, very sharp. If I throw that universal LUT on there, it really kind of makes everything, yeah, flat looking creamier so that I can add that color back in and really sort of adjust how it's going to look after the fact, right? Again, if too much is baked in at times, and by the way, doing this isn't necessarily going to make your footage look great either. You may in fact even reveal more degradation of your signal. It's just the idea of this is where you can access them. So again, I imported the 7D UEX SL, and this is what you're seeing applied to the content here. So if I go into my effects controls, again, you can see I've got Lumetri color applied here. So if I were to turn this off, there's that original footage, okay? And there's the flat version. Now, that's just with applying this simple Canon 70 LUT, all right? And at this point, now what I can do is I can start to get creative with some of these additional looks. Now, keep in mind, of course, the signal flow of Lumetri follows exactly what you see inside the panel here. So first we have the input LUT, but then we have additional white balancing, temperature tint, and tone control. So you can see that I've also dropped the contrast even further. So this was the contrast with just the LUT applied. But still, as I was looking at this, and I'll just pull these up for a moment, actually the black level looks pretty okay, but I wanted to give myself kind of even more detail, even more uh, latitude in the shadows. So I dropped the contrast even more and you can actually see down here. I mean, look at suddenly, it's so funny, a moment ago, do you remember when we were looking at that footage off the camera? You didn't see anything. Now you can actually see the cable, you can see the curtains, you can see the edge of the chair. Oh, you can't see any of that because my camera's in the way. There we go. Uh, you can actually see these things behind the chair. Again, you can see the chair here, you can actually see the couch, you can see the pole. There's just a lot more definition than what we were seeing moments ago when we were on that master footage, okay? So from this flattened look, now again, I can do more, I can adjust shadows and highlights. The highlights look pretty good to me. This is another example, again, when we look at, um, at our scopes here, certainly nothing is blown out. Now, one of the things to keep in mind too uh, whether you're shooting log or whether you're just shooting in general, probably the most important thing you can do when shooting, um, if you're thinking about color grading this after the fact, is um, getting your exposure right. I know that's an obvious thing to say, but in terms of working with color, particularly if you're working with 8-bit footage, exposure is everything. If something is underexposed, and you bring it in here and now you start readjusting exposure, you're very likely going to see those kind of blocky artifacts. You're going to see potential banding. Um, it's all about exposure. Now, again, the camera exposure control inside of basic corrections, it's going, to, it's going to work like your camera. It's going to function like your camera. And you can be very subtle with this and actually deliver pretty amazing results. But keep in mind that it's all about kind of exposing things properly. Okay, so once we did this to the footage, and again, the only additional change that I made to this was contrast, I'm just going to show you real quickly a couple of the examples of sort of the graded look that was applied on top of this via the creative panel. All right, and then we're going to get in, we're going to get into a couple different examples of these various looks. Okay, so here's one, and I'll just play a little bit of this back. You can also see that I've got this film, uh, film grain overlay. I think this came from Gorilla Grain. This one here, I think it's a 16 millimeter, super, super grainy uh, overlay. I've got this playing back at quarter resolution. But uh, you can see, if you take a look here, I've actually got an adjustment layer applied. Where's that adjustment layer? Let's go into our effects controls here. Okay. Let's, you know, let's turn off that grain because it's kind of getting in the way. All right. I've got an adjustment layer applied here. And on that adjustment layer, I have none other than the Fuji Eterna 250D. So we talked about this last week. This is one of the film stock emulations. And you can see how, again, this was the 
just flattened version, and then with the LUT applied. And you can see how it just brought back a little bit more of the color, but also because we're using this film stock LUT, it kind of gives it that more classic feel. Elements of this are softened. Um, the color isn't, it's not as vibrant, but it was also just too much before. It looked way too digital, super harsh. Now it's kind of smooth and it kind of feels like I wanted it to feel. Again, when you take a look at something like this and we go back into that uh, source material, I mean, you know, look at those curtains, everything, that green. I mean, this, it's funny. This looks like it was decorated in the 70s. This looks like it was broadcast in the 70s. And that's what I was going for. I wanted it to have this old school looking aesthetic, not yikes, super digital. By the way, uh, this is just a little nerd thing to point out here, but you'll notice that um, the strings on the bass, the strings on his guitar, even the, um, the band around the sound hole here, you're seeing some blockiness. Yeah, we're getting a little moraying there. That's because I seem to remember this was shot with one of my favorite Canon lenses, um, the 16 to 35 f2.8. And I was probably, I was probably all the way out. I mean, you have to realize we were in a very small room. I had to get both of us. It was very, and I had to guess where the edge of the base was. So because I was below 24 millimeters on the, the original 7D, um, you're getting that moraying, right? That sort of jagged look here on those strings. Um, obviously, if you shoot above 24 millimeter, that's not an issue. And the newer Canon DSLRs have that anti-moraying filter, so you won't see that anymore. Unfortunately, not a heck of a lot you can do about that. I was at probably 16 millimeters, and that's just, that's what you're going to get. Anyway, but you can kind of see the difference right there. There's the original, and there's the flat with the color added back in, kind of giving it that softer 70s look. Now, taking that a step further, I wanted to... Um, Additionally, now let's see. Oh, it's where is it? This one here. Um, go for sort of a a very different look with uh, another performance from this same session. So let's go ahead and skip over to this one. Let's see here. Little baby loves short and short. Mom's little baby loves short and Little baby loves short and short. Mama's little baby loves short and red. Put on the skillet, put on the lid. Feed them children some short and red. Let's talk about HSL secondaries, secondary color correction. I'm going to show you three examples of this. Uh, color correcting something in the shot, like this jacket here. Color correcting skin and then using this technique for replacing sky. So here we have uh, a clip. Now this was uh, some content that we showed on the road a couple of years ago. And this is a perfect shot to uh, to sort of showcase this next, next feature and this element of the Lumetri color panel called HSL secondaries. So in this shot, we wanted to recolor uh, the jacket that our actor was wearing here. And this is something that we'd be doing after the fact. Now it's also worth pointing out that we happen to be working on uh, red footage here. You can see we've got some R3D content, really, really nice. All right, so how do we do this? Well, let's go ahead and twirl down HSL secondary. Now, this is not unlike doing what a lot of you, I'm sure, have done in, in Photoshop, or when you mask and you use that checkbox, localize, select localized color clusters, where you isolate a specific color range, a specific range of colored pixels, and then you have the option via the mask or the mat that you've generated to only affect the color in that space. Well, that is exactly what we're going to do here. The idea is that we set the key, we set the color that we're aiming to control or modify. We can adjust the HSL parameters, the hue, the saturation, and the luminance values. We then can refine that mask via denoising or blurring, and then we can correct or modify. So the first step is setting the color that we're trying to isolate. So you'll see up at the top here of HSL secondaries under key, we have the familiar Adobe eyedroppers. So let's go ahead and start by clicking right here onto the jacket. And I'm simply going to turn on the mask right here. All right. So right away, you can see that we need to make some adjustments to this. So I'm going to go ahead and grab my top triangle, first of all, here on hue and make some adjustments to that. Okay. Following hue, we're going to go down to saturation. Now, by the way, the top triangle that you see 
is the range, and the bottom triangle is the feather. Okay, and you can actually see that displayed here visually. And then we're going to go into luminance and further make that adjustment as well. Okay, and this one needs a little bit more tweaking. So we'll get it just about like that. Watch that feather, not too much. Come back here to saturation. All right, again, I'm going to remove some of that feather as well because I'm seeing a little bit down here that we don't want. And then come back into the hue. And just adjust that range ever so. All right, just like that. Okay, and let's turn off our mask. So now we can see the exact range of color that we're going to be affecting, all right? So at this point now, we can, again, denoise or blur. I don't know that we really need a blur on here. Uh, if I'm doing like a sky or face, typically I'll do about a 0.25 pixel blur. For the jacket, I think we're okay. But at this point, all I really need to do is focus on the correction, all right? So for the simplest way to do that, I can simply come down to temperature over here. And you can see this visually as I drag it towards the blue, we're now changing that color. Or I can drag it towards, warm it up towards the orange. Now, what you're also seeing is up at the top here, I kind of missed some of his shoulder right there. So I can actually come back in via my, and by the way, I'm going to make this a little bit bigger. Let's make this 100%. I'm going to come back in with my additive eyedropper, and let's just select right up there, since that color wasn't quite getting picked up quite as well. Let's go back to fit. By the way, at any point in time, I can turn back on the mask, and you can see now we're actually seeing that whole range. You can see the edge of his shoulder there. So we brought that color back in pretty good. All right, come back down here. Let's make it nice and purple. All right, let's fit this back into view. Okay, and we can do additional corrections here if we so desire. All right, something like this. Okay, let's make this very, very noticeably different. Okay, now remember, of course, this is live video. So as we play this, just as I showed you last week, we have uninterrupted playback, which allows us to kind of go A and B on and off to see how this is affecting the shot very easily. No skill required. Set your key, refine the key, correct the pixels in that key or in the mask. Really easy. Now, where this becomes extremely useful in a case like this is that we have multiple shots where he's in this jacket that we need to fix. So one of the easiest things to do, and we talked about this last week, is to leverage copy-paste attributes. So I can simply right-click copy like this. And let's skip ahead to where we see the jacket again. Oh, missed it. All right. Here's the shot. Right-click, paste attributes, paste lumetry color. OK. Purple jacket. Real simple. Before, after. And you might think, well, how does it do that, how does it, well, because it's the same color range, right? Now, keep in mind, um, lighting, all of these things will affect uh, how it actually appears in the shot. So this shot, the lighting was actually, while it's obviously not as bright, fairly similar. So it worked really, really nicely. Uh, if we back up over here, again, the range that we're actually seeing on screen here is, it's, it's a little different. So if we paste the attributes, I'm not so 100% sure it's gonna do it exactly what we want. Um, yeah, so we'd have to come in and refine this because, again, these darker hues, because of the lighting, because of the shot, they're not part of the sample that we took. So we might have to go in and individually tweak, but we've got a starting point, right? And as you can see, even in a shot like this, it just worked really, really nicely. So we'd probably go in and just individually tweak this one and get those colors back into range really simply, okay? So that's using HSL secondaries to control color, like again, on a specific article. You can imagine, I've done this before, changing the color of someone's glasses or changing the color of a hat or a shirt or something like that, or some specific element in the shot, you can do very, very easily via HSL secondaries. Where this becomes, again, very, very useful is in using this for skin tone, where you might have done a little bit of work on the overall shot, 
but we really just want to focus on enhancing skin tone, right? And this can be done after you've done your basic grade. Um, this is done virtually, I'm imagining, on every sort of thing you see on television and or Netflix or wherever, specifically when you see things where everyone's just sort of that <sighs> orange, you know, kind of look. Um, that's post, that's, that's all grading, right? <laughs> you know, as much as I would love to have a daily spray tan, you know, it's just, it's just as easy to do it on screen via HSL secondary. So the same concept applies here, where we're going to take our sample and then refine that sample. So once again, here we have this footage from Egypt. Let's come in with our eyedropper and make a sample on his face, okay? And you can see immediately how the range of color here on HSL um, changes and moves. Now, I probably need to make additional samples before I even begin adjusting those parameters. So let's again come back in here. I'll select his cheek. Now you might say, oh, but it's picking up all this other stuff in the background. Well, yes, these are the skin tones. Similar skin tones around him are also being picked up as well. All right. Now at this point, uh, if we turn back off the mask, I'm just kind of looking to see. Yeah, I mean, there's some areas in his beard right there. Let's turn back on the mask. Grab that additive op eyedropper there. Whoops, okay, that's too much. Let's back off on that. Let's back off on that. Okay, starting to look pretty good. Now here's where, again, we have to be careful because, all right, you know, he's got some stubble in there, but we can probably refine this a little bit better. So we'll come into the luminance here, all right, something like that. This is where we add a little bit of feather. Saturation. Okay. Now you see it's not affecting his eyebrows or his hair. Why? Because those skin tones aren't in the eyebrows and hair. Okay. A little bit of feathering there. And let's readjust the range. Okay. And I'm not, you know, this isn't perfect, but we'll worry about that in a minute. Okay. A little bit of that in his lips, just a tad, just a tad. Okay. Now this is where, again, I might add a little bit of blur. So I'm gonna add about a 2.5, a 0.25 pixel blur. Whoops, not a 21.7% pixel blur. 0.25, all right, like that. And now, if I simply want to warm up the skin tone, I can do just that, okay? Or we can cool it off, or we can desaturate. Okay. Or we can add a little bit of contrast just to the skin tone without affecting everything else in the shot. And this is where if I wanted to get a little bit more of a cinematic feeling here, again, I love the skin tone. I like the background. I like the light and kind of the soft color behind us. Um, maybe we'll just add a little bit of a subtle vignette on here. Okay. Something like this just to darken the corners. Now you'll remember from last week, this was shot with the 18 to 135 non-fixed aperture, F3.5 to F5.6. So as I zoom out, you'll see those little flickers. But as we play this back, okay, you can see real nicely, look at how wonderful the skin tone looks. Again, here's before, here's after. Before, after. And it didn't touch the reds, it didn't touch the blues, it didn't touch any of the other colors that weren't in that specific range. Now remember, of course, we still have, again, the ability to modify other elements in the overall shot here. So now if we were to go make a change, you know, to the temperature here, now that's going to affect everything, including, you know, obviously bits of what we already selected on our face there. So we can further control the overall look of this shot, okay? Maybe go into creative. Now, this is again where applying a LUT here, uh, careful, you know, I'm not sure what it's gonna do there. Um, something like that. And that kind of looks sort of documentary-ish, kind of like that. Sky is quite a bit blown out there though. Yeah, see, to me that looks way nicer, okay? And as we reference our scopes real quickly here, let's go to our Lumetri scopes. Okay. Got some stuff in the shadows here. It's just really pegging kind of crushed, crushed levels. Again, we'll talk more about this next week. But the shot, it really, it's really kind of come to life, you know, just by adjusting those skin tones, okay? 
real easily, real simply. And this kind of gives you, again, a good look at that original shot before we affected the skin tone and after with the additional corrections that we did here. So that's using it for skin tones, HSL secondaries for skin tones. Now, the last thing I'm going to show you uh, with regard to HSL secondaries here, and then I'll show you a couple of before and after examples, is using this as a very, very basic technique for sky replacement or alteration. So here we have, again, a shot of the Sphinx and, and the Big Pyramid. And this was just how the sky looked. It was a beautiful day. But by the time we made it over here, at the time of day, looking up, the sky was just, it was, it just was, it was basically blown out. There was some blue, but from the angle I, where I was standing, I, again, this is how it was captured. Now, maybe with a better camera, maybe if I was able to shoot in log, which again is going to give me that maximum dynamic range, allow me to restore a lot of the detail in the highlights with my 7D recording with a, you know, just a flat picture style, um, 8-bit compressed to H.264. This is what I ended up with. And I just wanted to add back in a little bit of blue just to give me a little bit of color back in there. All right. So there are many ways to do this. There are full mask workflows and after effects where we would actually replace a proper sky, a video of a sky or even a still in this shot. But here we can use the same HSL secondary technique to um, just add back in some color to that very blown out white area very quickly. So I'll click on HSL secondaries. Once again, we're going to set our color. Now, it's worth pointing out, you've got these preset uh, color, uh, well, I was going to say color bubbles. What are these? They're just color presets. So if you're targeting reds or yellows or greens or cyan or blue or white, you can start with these. Um, I've actually found in this shot because of the low contrast, selecting this white one didn't work as well. So I'm going to use the eyedropper. All right kind of do it like that and we'll turn on our mask okay and again we're going to make some adjustments okay our saturation all right like that and come down into luminance okay All right, just about like that. And because of the nature of this, I'm actually going to add a little bit of blur. Now, again, I don't want to add too much blur because then we're going to end up with something like that, which almost looks beveled. <laughs> but very, very subtle amount of blur, yeah, like a 0.3, just to kind of soften that edge because the idea here is that we're going to be adding some color back in. So as mentioned, come over here. All right. Let's start with our temperature, and then there's just dial a little bit of blue back in there. All right, something like that. We can go ahead and loop this. All right, and just kind of take away, I mean, the sky was, it was so horribly blown out. This now at least looks a bit more how I remembered it looking, okay? Something like that. Again, we can go the other way too. Not how I remember it looking. I remember it looking like this, okay? Adjust our tint if need be. A little bit of magenta. A little bit more contrast. For after. Okay. It's subtle. There's not much to go on here. Again, completely blown out, but a very quick way to add some of that back in. Now, once again, if we wanted to go even further on this, because we have access to the whole shot here um, via basic corrections and or the creative looks, you know, we might be able to accentuate. You know, see, that one's not going to work. Again, this is you're seeing how these are being affected after applying that, that one might be okay. You know, this is where we might have to go into something like one of these uh, blue steel or something like that. You know, that's kind of working in terms of a stylistic feeling, but maybe not overall. 
All right, that one actually looks pretty good. Fuji Clean. All right, we can intensify that. Increase vibrance. All right, and if we add a little bit of a vignette here to add a little more drama, that's going to increase kind of the darkness of the blue in the corners there. Go to our effects controls. Before, after, before, after. And that now feels exactly as I how I remembered it when this was shot way back when. Okay. Cool. So, basic corrections, input LUTs, creative LUTs as we discussed last week, HSL secondaries. All right. Now, what I wanted to show you, the last thing here was just because my project files... Um, for whatever reason, my sequences got a bit, a bit mangled there. Not quite sure what happened. Let me instead. I've got um, a whole bunch of before and afters here that I wanted to show you. So I'm just going to pull up my media browser over here. I think these are side by side. Yeah. Okay. Cool. All right. So let's go back to this. So again, this is stuff that I did. Uh, a while ago, but just as valid now, and if anything, maybe even more so because you can kind of appreciate the change. Now, I also want to point out this was this stuff was about five years ago. Um, how I grade now <laughs> is a bit more subtle. Remember, we talked about this last week. Very easy to overdo a lot of these processes, but this just kind of shows you. Um, here we go, like full screen, and I'll turn the camera off for a second here. Uh, on the left, you've got your pre-noise reduction, pre-grade, ISO 2500 in total darkness, post-noise reduction, post-grade on the right. All right. Now, this, again, is a shot done in darkness, but that was done. This was shot with the, um, the 200 to 400 F4 on the D4, on the Nikon D4. So, I mean, just look, there's just some really beautiful... Again, shallow depth of field here, probably shooting at f4 at ISO 2500 um, on this leopard in the dark, which is really, really cool. Uh, let's see. This is another one here. Uh, this is another cool one. Again, we're seeing the in-camera flattened, desaturated, de-sharpened, de you know, de-contrasted look. And then here's the post-graded version. Now, where this gets really, and there's some very beautiful, again, sharpness here, naturally done just via the lens, and I'm I'm focusing as he's moving there. Here's a good example, though, where you can really see how you, you start to bring out detail, um, again, kind of in the background there and the color of those leaves. You know, look at there. There was a lot of noise in this shot. By the way, I used that neat video noise reduction, N-E-A-T, to tackle that color noise. I don't know how much of that's coming through on stream. It just looks really beautiful and smooth and clear here. Um, all right, let's do, let's see, hippos and water bucks. This is a good one, lioness and cubs, yeah. A bit more subtle here, but kind of gives you the idea. By the way, this also showcases uh, Premiere Pro's warp stabilizer. So this is the original shot on the left and then the stabilized and graded shot on the right. By the way, the crop is less aggressive these days. Again, this was shot a couple of years ago. Um, here's another example here. This one I went with a very stylistic, stylistic creative look. And I actually remember this particular shot was done in speed grade, if I'm not mistaken. Um, back when I was kind of getting into speed grade. But this also speaks to, you know, this was shot on the D800, but I didn't use the HDMI out. I was just recording directly to the admittedly higher bitrate H.264, but MPEG-4 nonetheless. And you can still see there's a lot of beautiful shadow detail there. Okay. Now this one here with the elephant, this is a bit more aggressive. I don't, I wouldn't grade this like this now because I really crushed the blacks a bit too much. But it just kind of shows you that very desaturated flat look on the left and really just bringing up the highlights and the detail um, on the right side, okay? In a super clean way. And uh, last one here. Oh, is that not a side-by-side? -side? Here's a side-by-side. -side. 
Lion. Love this one. You can actually purchase this one on Adobe Stock. <laughs> Again, you know, I told you it was winter time last week, and you can just see how it's, I mean, there's just nothing there. It's really almost mono, monochromatic looking, but suddenly when you start adding some of that color back in when you start, you know, adjusting contrast, getting a little bit creative, even though it's winter, even though, yes, he's in the bush and it's really, it's very lifeless. You can just bring out the life of the color present in the leaves. I mean, look at these things. It just looks, there's some real beauty here in this particular shot. And this was all done using, um, Again, some of those very basic techniques that I showed you before. All right. Well, my friends, that is it for today. So thank you so much again for joining me. My name is Jason Levine. Have a great rest of your day wherever you are in the world, and we will see you again next time. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye.